Weighing the Evidence of Climate Change, a Fact-Based Case for a Rational Path Forward, or Why This Petroleum Engineer is a Believer, and Why We Need a Rational versus a Radical Solution, by George Sharp. Climate change is a bit like a religion. Can I get an amen? Like the existence of God, man-caused climate change cannot be proven beyond a doubt. There are believers and there are skeptics, and they draw a line in the sand defending their position. Then there are the rest of us here in the middle, not sure what to believe, but tired of the noise. How about we look at the evidence for ourselves and see where it leads us? Turns out there are strong arguments on both sides. Making the right answer on man-caused climate change a maybe or a probably rather than an absolute yes or no, and making the right path forward a balanced approach to bring on more carbon-free power. Not the absolute panic the alarmists are proposing or the it's all a hoax stance being taken by the skeptics. Let's first take a look at the evidence on the skeptics side of the argument. First, since the earth was formed over five billion years ago, numerous natural causes from the tilt of the earth, the changes in our orbit around the sun, to sunspots and solar flares, to volcanic activity, have all been causing the climate to continually change. Nature is the cause, not man. Number two, compared to nature, man contributes less than 4% of annual total CO2 emissions. And CO2 is less than 5% of total greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, water vapor being the primary. Therefore, man's contribution is less than two-tenths of 1% of the total. Arguably, not very much. Number three, average global temperature calculations are inherently inaccurate and are estimates at best. Further, the computer climate models used to forecast the effects of higher CO2 concentrations don't accurately account for the multitude of variables that affect climate and therefore are unreliable and diverge widely from one to another. We can't predict the weather much beyond 10 days because the physics is too complex. So trying to predict the climate 10 or 100 years from now is far from certain. Number four, while there is a correlation between atmospheric CO2 concentrations and global temperatures over the last 400,000 years, it is a reverse correlation where the CO2 actually follows the temperature change instead of causing it. The reason is because massive amounts of CO2 are dissolved in the ocean, and as the temperature heats up, CO2 converts to a gas and comes out of the water. Number five, there is absolutely no correlation between CO2 and temperature when looking at the entire geologic history. Specifically, there was an ice age during the Ordovician era when CO2 concentrations were 20 times higher than today. Even though CO2 is a greenhouse gas, the lack of correlation shows that CO2 has not been the major factor driving climate change. Number six, if CO2 was the driving factor over geologic time, then once CO2 concentrations got high enough, the temperature would just continue to increase. The fact that it did not again proves that CO2 is a minor factor and other variables are driving climate change. Number seven, given the many complex variables that affect weather and the climate, the thought that man can control the climate merely by limiting CO2 emissions is both arrogant and ludicrous. In regard to climate, mankind is not in control. Number eight, even if man is having an effect on the climate, efforts made by the U.S. to curb CO2 emissions will be more than offset by the growth in carbon energy consumption forecast for Asia. Therefore, any action to lower CO2 emissions in the U.S. will have little benefit for the climate and will do nothing but raise the cost of energy, slow the economy, and cost jobs. Number nine, even if man is affecting the climate, the alarmist predictions of Armageddon are extreme exaggerations as the worldwide deaths by natural disaster have dropped drastically through the last century. Contrarily, in 2017, 1.6 million people died from diarrhea from lack of clean water and proper sanitation that energy brings. If we are worried about the poor of the world, we should be at least as concerned about trying to provide them energy now as we are about whether their descendants will survive natural disasters in the future. Now let's look at the evidence on the believer's side of the argument. First, since the start of the Industrial Revolution some 200 years ago, the atmospheric CO2 level has increased from a fairly stable 280 parts per million to over 400 parts per million currently. While this is not the highest CO2 level in geologic history, the CO2 content is significantly higher than in the last 500,000 years. Even though man's emissions are less than 4% of natural emissions, when added to a system that was previously in equilibrium, where the CO2 sinks equals the CO2 sources, man's emissions have tipped the balance. Number two, 
The cumulative CO2 emitted by man since the 1800s roughly equals the increase in CO2 in the atmosphere, lending credence to the conclusion that man is the cause for the incremental increase. Number three, even the skeptical scientist will agree that CO2 is a greenhouse gas. All other factors remaining the same, more CO2 in the air is going to result in increasing temperatures. Number four, since the start of the Industrial Revolution, global temperatures have increased dramatically. This can be seen from the graph of 400,000 years of CO2 cycles, which mirror climate cycles. Most natural cycles take over 100,000 years to repeat. Solar flares, another natural cause, have cycles of only 11 years, so they are also not the likely culprit. The only thing that directly correlates with the recent increase in temperature is the increase in CO2 associated with the Industrial Revolution. And finally, number five, the skeptics are right. Average global temperatures are estimates at best, and different computer models vary widely in their predictions. But that doesn't make them useless. No matter how inaccurate the temperature measurements may be, all estimates show it to be increasing. No matter how unreliable the projections from the various computer models may be, the direction of their predictions is consistent. In short, the higher atmospheric CO2 concentrations may not be the only cause of the recent increase in global temperatures, but they darn sure can't be helping. So what is the consensus? Don't be silly, there is no consensus, the 97% of scientists notwithstanding. In the words of renowned climatologist Paul Simon, people hear what they want to hear and disregard the rest. Another criticism from the skeptics is that the 97% number is bogus. And the scientists are towing the line to A, secure funding, and B, to fit in with the group. While there may be some truth to that statement, I'm a believer who is in the exact opposite situation. I depend on carbon energy for my income, and I have many skeptical peers who I like and admire. I see the validity in all of the skeptics' arguments. But just like I have 7.5 billion reasons why I believe in an inclusive God, I have 7.5 billion energy using reasons why I believe man has some impact on the climate and the planet. However, since it is clear that many other factors have had a far greater impact on past climate variations, we should be judicious in our approach. If the skeptics are right and the recent increase in temperatures are due to other natural factors beyond man's control, we may go through great expense eliminating our CO2 emissions with no measurable impact on the climate. That money may be better spent getting ready for higher sea levels, not thinking that we can stop them. Climate activist Michael Schellenberger's book, Apocalypse Never, is a scientifically fact-based argument that climate change, while real, is not the apocalypse that the alarmists predict and requires practical, not radical, solutions. In regard to higher sea levels, he points out that 26% of the Netherlands is below sea level, so man is incredibly capable of adapting. So given all that, what do I see for the future? Well, I'm just one little engineer in quarantine doing some back of the envelope calculations, but here's my guess. Wind and solar will certainly play a growing role in our energy mix, and I'm good with that. But as Michael Moore pointed out in his new documentary, Planet of the Humans, wind and solar require expansive surface footprints, they only generate power intermittently, and they come with significant environmental impact. So they are not the end-all answer. I believe man will ultimately need to rely on a number of energy sources to meet our growing need, all of which impact the environment. Specifically, we need to get over our fear of and aversion for nuclear, as it is a compact and reliable source of 24-7 baseload power. Fukushima, Chernobyl, and Three Mile Island were all built in the 60s and 70s. And as Bill Gates points out, newer technology accounts for earlier design flaws and is infinitely safer. Further, because newer designs more completely process uranium, they have a much cleaner waste stream to dispose of. Therefore, just like the subs and ships of the U.S. Navy, I predict micro-nuclear plants wherever the power is needed. Hydrogen energy, fuel cells, and or fusion may also develop into feasible resources. In the meantime, clean burning natural gas will continue to play a major role, not just in the transition, but quite possibly in the final solution. What nobody seems to appreciate is how long that's going to take. First, with carbon currently supplying 80% of our energy needs, we can't just turn off carbon without turning out the light, so to speak. The table on the change in our energy use over the last several years tells the tale. America uses approximately 100 quadrillion BTUs, or quads, of energy every year. Wind and solar share of the total is still less than 4%, and even with tax incentives and record investments, 
hasn't been increasing very fast. At the current rate of growth, it will take over 200 years to replace all carbon energy. The bottom line is that it would be absolute economic suicide to ban fossil fuel production before we have reliable and plentiful energy alternatives. Further, with electricity currently supplying only 40% of our energy use, the balance being transportation, manufacturing, and home heating, it is going to be a monumental task converting to an all-electric world, much less a carbon-free one. It will require replacing all carbon generation and then more than doubling our current power generation capabilities. Because wind and solar only generate electricity a fraction of the time compared to nuclear plants, if they are the primary replacement resources, then let's more than double that again with each facility chewing up vast amounts of land. And with all that spread out power, we would also need to add thousands of miles of transmission lines to bring the power to the cities. Finally, a 100% electric world would require the total revamp of our distribution systems to handle the increased power requirements of a bunch of electric heated homes with plugged-in electric vehicles. Ironically, no matter the energy source, lawsuits by environmental activists will bog down permitting and will plague that expansion every step of the way. Therefore, despite the very same activist demands that we immediately ban fracking and eliminate the use of all oil and gas, mankind will continue to need carbon energy for a long, long time. In closing, these are crazy times. The climate change conversation, just like every other political topic, is being dominated by the extremes. Unfortunately, the two sides are proposing paths forward where, metaphorically, man will either freeze in the dark or burn in hell, if you will. How about we find a middle ground that acknowledges the probability that we're impacting the climate, along with the absolute reality that we still need carbon energy. Note that it's been well over 200 years to get to this point, and the mothership is not going to turn on a dime. But just because it is a long and difficult task doesn't mean we shouldn't start heading in that direction. Being judicious about what we do does not mean doing nothing. After examining the evidence, I'm in the probable category that man's emissions are a major factor affecting climate change. But even if you're only in the maybe category, then I would argue that we probably need to do something about it. So let's collectively roll up our sleeves and start addressing climate change just like we would eat any other elephant, one bite at a time. The end of this video anyway, if not the debate. Please go to YouTube to see more videos I've made on energy. Understanding energy puts the importance of energy in perspective and helps you appreciate the fact that our lives absolutely depend on it. Using simple everyday analogies, the Big Gulp Theory explains the math and the physics behind an oil and gas reservoir. The more you understand things, the less scary they seem. Speaking of scary, don't Fear the Frack reviews the evidence that convinced President Obama not to be afraid when his EPA concluded their in-depth study back in 2015. And finally, the economics of climate change presents Nobel Prize winning Dr. William Nordhaus's analysis showing that the right path forward requires balance, lest we choke on the elephant, so to speak. Please take the time to learn more about energy. Your way of life, quite literally, depends on it.